Welcome back guys, Edward Gonzalez here. Today I'll be talking about Lightroom, Nikon, perhaps some of NX Studio as well. I'll probably toss some of that in there. But mostly relating to Nikon and how Nikon cameras, legacy cameras that start all the way from the D3, D700 rating up all the way to today are now able to be read properly in Lightroom as well as other enhancements that came about. And that's the ability to read raw files in Lightroom natively. Doesn't mean you can go crazy about your adjustments here, but you can do minor adjustments, which is pretty nice. So I'm gonna cover some of that and how all of these features will make your workflow a lot easier. So let's go over some of the enhancements and see how it might pretend to you. So let's start with enhanced details. With enhanced details, as you guys can see here, I have a D700 image here. D700 images are only 12 megapixels. So as you guys may know, they're small. It does not mean that it will give you better quality images that you can blow it up to maybe a 36 megapixel. But what it will do is exactly enhance the image as it says, it will create you better tonality and sharpen the image a little more. So for example, this image is pretty well sharp and it's shot at 1.8, yeah, it's at 1.8 here you guys can see is very focused and the sharpest area is here if you were to do enhanced image or enhanced details it will probably do just a little bit to make it better so we'll click here or Control alt i and as you can see this window pops up when that window pops up you can drag it and then it will show you the area that you want to focus on and let's say this is your focus point which in this camera which in this situation it was here, you guys can see that it will create an enhancement image. Once you click enhance, it will create its own file as a DNG file that you can work on. That's the improved file with better tonality and so forth. So let's check out the differences and see how that looks. Here's the original file. No, this is not the original file. This is the original NEF file from Nikon. And this is the enhanced image. It increased the tonality where you can't really tell the difference. So let's see if we can go A, R and A. Uh, here, the other one. Let's zoom in. Here, side by side of the enhancements. So, side by side, it doesn't seem like it created much, but the tonality, the colors did shift a little bit. If you were to go full screen, you'll see it, especially here in the blacks. Here, it looks a little more soft, where here's a little more contrasty. As far as sharpness goes, the enhanced version looks a little sharper than this one. As you guys can see here in the details, here. It's a lot sharper and it's a lot nicer. If you want AI to take over and give you a nice enhanced file, this is the way to go about it. I'll tell you one thing that it will not make your file a lot better. It will just sharpen it and decrease the saturation, perhaps uh, up your shadows and lower the highlights to give you a more of a high dynamic range file, if you would say. But overall, it will not increase the pixel count whatsoever. So this is a nice feature. If you don't, do not really want to mess around with the, pre, uh, with the presence here at all, but you can actually pretty much do that yourself and still achieve the same results. One of the best features that was just released also was the fact that you can read ProRes raw files now in Lightroom. Before you couldn't do so, but now you can. And that is extremely beneficial for a lot of us, especially if you want to create file sequences, if you want to create thumbnails or whatnot, whatever the, the use may be from an actual file from ProRes RAW or any video format file for that may be. Now here's the best portion about it. You can actually play the files here. Um, you see, um, there's a lot of music that was captured in the background, so I can't really play it all, but you can play the file. Some of the features here are very awesome actually. And that's the fact that you can modify the look of the file. You can you can modify the color, uh, give it a creative look, turn it to black and white, defaults, curves, grains, optics. And actually, just because you have all these features here doesn't mean that most of them are available to you. For example, optics, where is your color operation correction? You cannot change that. When you press on that, you get this message here. When you get this message, that means that that's not available, but it tells you exactly what it is that you can change. For example, you can go to color and you can go to high contrast. You can increase the contrast and then you go back here again. Um, and then you go, let's say to creative 
and then you get a, give it a vintage instant look. So it will change that to that and then you can also adjust the exposure, the contrast, the contrast and the vibrance. Like I said, you can stack them. You can do whatever it is you may want. If you want to go back to defaults, you just press defaults. That's your Adobe defaults and then you, can, you have your camera defaults. I will talk about camera defaults in a little bit. This feature here is the one that actually most people may tend to overlook the hidden features that are within. For example, here you have this button In this button, you have two options. You have capture frame and set poster frame. When you go to poster frame, that's basically the thumbnail that you see when you open up a file, when you open up a folder rather, and you see all your files there and you see an image in there that represents the, uh, the video. So usually by default, it just grabs whatever it wants to and sets that as the thumbnail. From here, you can change that and create your own capture frame, uh, poster frame for that matter. So you can create your own poster frame and then set that to be. You can also capture frame, which is basically the same thing you do in Premiere when you just take, when you grab a, a screenshot and then you take that to Lightroom and you modify it to, uh, to be your new thumbnail or if you want to do some minor modifications to that, then bring it back, maybe create your own LUT. But one of the features that you may perhaps are not see and will not be seeing until you export is this. So you go Control Shift E. And one of the things I want to show you guys is the fact that you can export this in H.264. It will export the files exactly with the current adjustments you just created. So if you want to bypass Premiere 100% and you already have a video that you like and you just want to export that into H.264 with the colors that Lightroom may give you, I would just do it here. And this, it's a lot better than uh, NX Studio when it comes to any color correction that you may be able to do to your files when it comes to video. So if you want to export an H.264 file, you can do so here and it will export it exactly with the same details as you did. So this is a, a 23.976 frames per second file in HD. It will export that as well in a H.264 format when with a quality of low, medium or high or max. So if you set it to max, it's perhaps what you may want, especially if you have a ProRes RAW file. The other feature to this is this one here. I have no clue what DPX means, but I had to look it up. And what that gave me was the fact that it is a DPX file. It's a roster image saved in a digital picture exchange format. And just like H.264, it is a format, but it's not a video format. In fact, it's totally the opposite of that. And it also has the ability for it to create sequence files. This file format, I believe might be useful for animators. So if you're an animator, maybe this will come in handy, but if you're not an animator, don't use it unless you really have a need for it. If this is what you're after and you want to do it before but you couldn't, now you have the option to do so. Camera profiles. This is a feature that I just noticed, but I had a real hard time getting those camera profiles on this computer. I was able to get it on my laptop without a problem and then like I was trying to figure out why is it that I could not see it here. So maybe, just maybe, me showing you how to go about it and seeing those profiles may come in handy to you. Nikon color profiles have always been very nice and some of them are actually kind of like on the extremes as far as how they look but nonetheless you were never able to view those profiles in Lightroom. Now there's a way. If you want to see your Nikon color profiles in Lightroom and maybe for some other cameras as well this is how you go about it. So as you guys can see here this is something I've already done so Let's just take this out of and just put it in a single view. For example, this view here, this is a Nikon D810 photo. So this photo is 36 megapixels. And as you guys can see here where it says camera profile, it says camera flat. That's right. Let me reset this. This is exactly what was shot from the camera in a flat profile. It was also shot here. This is, uh, this is a D700 and this was shot in a standard version 4. Uh, let me see if this is the camera. That's a camera profile. You, uh, this was, was shot also in the same thing. Um, this is the um, yeah D700. This is the D700 with uh, standard color black and white. So all these files, even this one, which is morning uh, camera morning from Nikon, is accessible now in Lightroom. This is not easily accessible and not all cameras have the same uh, process. As you guys can see, when it comes to the Nikon Z6, you get this slider here. From zero to 100, you can adjust it in which way you want. Below that, it just goes back to, I believe, what a regular white balance would have been. Here we have a camera standard uh, with some adjustments. So let me reset those adjustments as well. Reset. 
uh, another one here, uh, Dramatic from the Nikon Z6. Some of these files are only on the Nikon Z6, whereas the V810 and the D700 don't have that. So this one's just the camera flat again from the D810. And let me show you now how that is, comes about. When you go to development, I think it is, if you go to edit, to preferences, it opens up to general. And here, in general, you see nothing really that matters. But when you go to presets, this is where you want to change the master's portion. It's usually set to Adobe default, switch it to camera settings. When you switch it to camera settings, you just press OK and everything should be OK, but it's not. If your files are already in Lightroom like this, these files are right now, whatever present was already preset there will actually overwrite this. Even though you change it right now, it will not, it will not switch it back to what it was. If that's the case, all you need to do so is just right click and say, uh, you go to metadata and you say read metadata from file and it will read you the actual camera profile onto this particular image. If you want to do it to all of them, I think you can highlight them all. Uh, if you highlight them all, maybe you're able to do it if you go to metadata. Yeah, if you, if you highlight them all, you might be able to actually read the metadata from the files. But if you want to get them from the get go, all you do is before you import your images, you go to edit. You go to preferences, then you go to presets and you set your masters to be camera settings. Once you do so, then you import your images. And once you import your images, you can get the color profiles from Nikon and maybe Canon as well. For now, I can tell you that if you want to bring in your profiles from Nikon and perhaps Canon, now you're able to do so. So let me turn on this camera. I have tethered up the DA10 to this computer so we can use it. Oh, well, it's kind of loud. It works with all the cameras like I show you on the list. Any camera that's on that list, you can tether and most likely do live view. So what we're gonna do right now is go to file, go to tether and start tether capture. Here you can choose a folder and that's where you want your files to go to so you can access them later. But once you do so, you just press okay. You get this, uh, there we go, the DA10 here on the bottom. So as you guys can tell, it tells you the camera uh, model. And then you have your light view, your shutter, your aperture. Now that lens is a 16 to 35. So uh, the aperture is an F4 and that's exactly what it's giving you. You can adjust it. You can go to F8, um, I believe. Is it on manual? Can I adjust it? No. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so it goes to F8. You can increase the ISO, lower the ISO. Uh, let's go to ISO 800 for that matter and see how that works out. Auto white balance, let's leave it at auto. Then you can change the developing settings if you want to as well. You go to live view and you get this thing here. In live view, you can see that it's trying to focus. The only problem I see is the fact that you cannot focus directly onto something you want to focus on. Let's say I want to click on my face or just the screen for here, for example, it focuses only on what's nearer or whatever it believes is more important in the actual frame. Clicking out of focus will allow the camera to choose its focusing points. If you click it again, you have a little more control, but you still do not have control. It only allows you to focus more towards the back or focus most, more towards the front. So if I put my hand here, I'm not sure if it will focus. It's still focusing on my head, on my head, but it's trying to focus on my hand right now, I believe. So if I go forward, let me do one more. Yeah. So right now it's focusing on my hand but you have to go through a whole bunch of trials. So this is mostly for monitoring purposes. If you want to use this feature, it's mostly to show your client, I would say. It's not really for you, but the problem with this also is, and I always have this problem uh, when it comes to tether use, is the fact that once you go into tether use, you lose control over your monitor on the back. So you cannot see whatsoever how the image is coming out. So then you have to rely mostly on your monitor, but then there's that lag. So you take an image, so I'm not taking an image right now, and let's see how long that lag is. Not a good picture, is it? Let's take it again.
Ah, it's much better. I hate taking photos of myself. It's pretty much well lit here, so it's no big deal right now as far as like how to capture this image. Plus it's at 5.6. The depth of field is not that bad, so it's all good. It took about five seconds. Everything opposed that, it took about two seconds or so. So the lag gets lower the more you use it because there's a constant connection going on. If you stop using it for a little bit, it kind of goes back to sleep mode. So then it takes a little longer to wake up. You can see if you zoom in, it's all pretty good right there. That's a pretty good looking dude, just saying. As you can tell in this tether view, you cannot see the proper tonality that the camera is using. For example, here the tones look a little more yellow or green for that matter than here. Here looks looks very flat, it's very much um, blue and whatnot with very low definition. So the live view is just to give you a proximity of what it is you're viewing, but it's not meant to give you an actual live view like you would through HDMI. But one thing you have noticed as well, since I've already set my preferences in the present to be camera master profile, that you see that it was a camera flat that came in. It was not the flat profile that Adobe usually creates. It uses the camera flat profile. So if it was to change it to anything else, it will still do the same thing. Whatever camera profile you want to do, just set it up prior to tether use, and then you can start shooting and you get the tonality that you're into. But this, this live view, and the fact that it works really good. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen it work this good before. The fact that I just plugged it in and it's set to go. It's really good, it's really good. So those are all the features I wanted to talk to you guys about. Most of the enhancements and camera features that we just saw right now are mostly meant towards Nikon and Canon users, but it doesn't mean that you, most of you guys cannot take advantage of it. A lot of this stuff perhaps still works with other cameras, although I can't really attest to that because I do not own anything else other than Nikon. Working with uh, Lightroom now will actually create uh, a better workflow, edit a lot, a lot faster with proper colors and tonality that you were used to when you were using perhaps NX Studio. So in NX Studio, you get to do the same things, except it's a little slower and perhaps not the best, uh, I would say it's not the best experience as far as batch work. So if you want to do batch work and you still wanted the Nikon profiles, now you have it in Lightroom. So this is very exciting. I hope all the features and enhancements that were shown, it's something that you were into or perhaps makes your life a lot easier. So with that, thank you, subscribe or not, you know, it's up to you. And I'll see you on the next one. See ya.